Christian Parenting. Understanding our own finances is hard enough, let alone knowing how to teach our children. The Family and Finances podcast hopes to take you from a place of stress, worry, and tension to a place of freedom, peace, and unity. If you're looking for peace of mind, contentment, and confidence in dealing with your finances, this is the podcast for you. And today we're going to talk about budgeting. And it's an area where many, many couples have pain. I read a survey recently that 60% of all people say they want to have a budget, but only 20% actually do. So 80% of the people are flying blind. And I know up front, you want to be sure everybody knows that you and I are experts on this area of managing money. (laughs) I thought you were going to say we were in the 80%. (laughs) We were for a long time. We were for a long time. Primarily because I thought my plan would work, which is always make just a little bit more than you spend. And I didn't want to write down anything. I didn't want to have to keep track of receipts. That sort of cramped my style. So you had to live in fear and uncertainty because we just didn't know where we were going. So ultimately, the pain got to us and we realized we have to start a budget. So today, let's go through sort of the steps of how to do that, some of the benefits of it, and give people some groundwork for how to make that happen. When I think about the benefits of budgeting, the first one I think of is that you can figure out how to live beneath your means. If you don't have that in place, you'll never know where you are. And so you'll just model along. You, 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 you will live with uncertainty. And the key to managing money is to spend less than you earn. And a budget tells you if you're being successful or not. Remember the the couple that told you they didn't make enough money to have a budget? Yeah, we were talking to them about establishing a budget, and they said, oh, we just don't make enough to have a budget. And what they meant was they didn't think they could put money in every one of the budgeting categories so a budget wouldn't work for them. And I remember telling them, uh, reality is, you don't make enough money not to have a budget. Everybody needs a budget, whether you make a lot of money or a little amount of money, because it reduces your stress. I think that's the second biggest benefit, is you just get rid of stress. You tell the money where it's going in advance, so you know you're going to make it through the month. And then finally, you start to make financial progress. In our first 21 years, we didn't achieve any of our goals because we were constantly trying to just bail out of the problems that we had. And so we had two decades of no progress. And I'm sure there's people who are listening now and saying, that's where we are. So many people today just can't seem to get ahead. So let's go through some of the ways you start a budget, some of the practical tips for how you do it. I would say there's really three models. One model is to do it through bank accounts. And we have friends who basically have automated everything. They have different bank accounts for everything in their budget. For instance, they automatically deposit money into an account that's for savings, but they also have one that's for spending and one that's for investing. So it's it's done uh, up front for them. And they just track their account balances. And they say it's very, very easy and simple for them. But it takes time to set that up in advance. You have to determine how much are we going to put into the savings account each month or each pay period. How much are we going to put in our spending? How much are we going to put in our vesting? And, of course, giving would come out of your spending or or savings account, whichever one you prefer. But some people automate it that way. You and I, we did it the old-fashioned way, which was just get a spreadsheet and write down everything we were spending. We started tracking, you know, saving receipts. And where we had a little difficulty is we were using the same bank account and the same credit card at the time, but I wouldn't save the receipts and just turn them into you. So you were keeping track of the receipts. You were uh, showing us where we were each month. And that simple process, sort of the old-fashioned way, writing on a sheet of paper, helped us to finally start making progress. And if you remember, we went to the envelope system. We started basically a cash budget. 
where we would allocate to what we needed for the things that we knew we were going to have spent on that month. And that brought us into alignment. Well, it's so much easier today with computers and phones and apps. People can track where they're, where they're spending. Well, so. that's sort of the modern way is to use an app. And there are a lot of great apps out there. There are a lot of great programs to help you track what you're spending. Mm-hmm. And the main thing, I think, is to be sure that you, you're not doing something that's going to surprise you at the end of the month. Because if you're using a credit card, as so many couples do, you can get to the point where you've run up so much on that monthly charges that you can't pay it off that month. And suddenly you're in trouble. Well, or, or if you have a quarterly payment, you have to set aside money on the other months so that you're able to make that payment when it's due. I'm thinking of maybe insurance or you know, some of those kind of expenses. Well, we had to figure out a way to work through that, and we set some goals and developed a plan. And the big change for us is you said our first financial goal was to begin to tithe. And we're going to talk about giving later on, but really that was was the beginning point of our agreement, that that would be our first and highest priority. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at you, Ann, and saying, well, what decade would you like to start? You know, I thought it would take us... 10 years to run up to that uh, amount because we were starting very small. Well, for me, paying God first made me realize that it all is His. It was just a reminder that it's all His, and everything we spend the rest of the month, we, have to, we, we are stewarding it. You know, we, we better manage it well. Well, I ask you that question, when, what decade do you want to start? Like, you know, in 10 years or 20 years <laughs> from now, and you said, I want to start right now. And I remember looking at you, and you said, well, uh, I said, Ann, if we, if we take 10% right off the top of our gross income and start giving it, do you understand that's going to change everything in our budget? And you looked at me and said, exactly. Well, and I had a friend tell me that when they gave, she felt like they were blessed in ways that they had not anticipated. Like they had expected they might have to replace a car in five years where their car lasted much longer than five years. Her washing machine lasted two decades, two decades. Of course, that was back when they made them really well, but it was like they they didn't really have to worry about other things when they got their priorities right. So our simple plan was we're going to put God first in our budget. We're going to save second. We Mm -hmm. also have to have uh, an allocation for taxes. And that left us with what's called net spendable income. In the past, we didn't know what our net spendable income was because we were just guessing and and we would give from our leftovers. So we reversed the whole budgeting process. We made God first, saving second, obviously had to plan for taxes. And then we had money that we could allocate for whatever we needed to spend. Mm-hmm. And in those categories, they can be divided into, you and I have sort of different ways of expressing that, but the fixed expenses and the variable expenses. Uh, We were doing some research on where most people go wrong in their budget, and it's not in the variable. The variable are the day-to-day things, running to the grocery store, eating out, uh, entertainment, travel, miscellaneous Most people think that's where they're going to really control their budget. But you know, and I know from doing this so long and talking to so many people, it's the things that you lock into, that you're committed to, that are usually the things that break most people's budget. Mm -hmm. That would be your mortgage, uh, your car payments, the debt you accumulate, your insurance costs, all of those sort of big items, the things that consume most of the American budget. In fact, the number one highest uh, expense in an American budget today is interest payments. When you look at interest on your mortgage, interest on your cars, interest on your consumer debts, that's where most of our money is going, into student Student loans. loans. And so if people will start by dividing into those two categories, first of all, you get to your net spendable income. You know, if you do what we did, which was 10% in giving, 10% in saving at that point in our life, 
And then taxes usually are going to average around 14% or more uh, for most people. You're talking about 65% left to spend. And if you don't do that calculation and you just assume, you know, when you get your check, I have 100% to spend, you're not aware of all the other things that are really needing to come out of that check. So we started to do that first. And then we took, now what do we have to spend? And we can allocate that into our fixed cost as well as into our variable cost. Right. And that kept variable cost down so that we didn't have consumer debt and interest to pay. Well, we ultimately got out of debt and Mm -hmm. removed that from our budget. And we started looking at our fixed expenses, for instance, our cars. Let's talk about cars because most families in America spend about 14% every month on transportation. You and I wanted to eliminate that aspect of our overhead. So share a little bit about what we did. Well, I don't know where to start except we decided not to buy, not to finance cars. That's the first place (laughs) we started. And I remember thinking, how do we do that? I don't know how we're going to, I don't know how we're going to live that way. Cars seem so expensive. And how would we ever be able to go and buy a car? But we had to make that decision Mm -hmm. that we would pay for them with cash. We would not finance them. You didn't, and you did not trade in our cars. You would sell those yourself. Yeah, sell them or do something with them. Sometimes mm-hmm. we've sort of given them away. Right. But we said if we buy them for cash, drive them as long as we possibly can, basically wear them out and just keep them up to date, repaired, then we will have overall less cost. And I was calculating our total expenses for vehicles, say for the past 20 years as we've been doing this, and is really, really low compared to what most people have in their budget. Well, and you've always wanted to buy super dependable cars, cars that don't require maintenance, that have long lives, and that's served us well. Well, the maintenance cost of a car is so expensive anymore that if you have something that has to be repaired often, I think you should get rid of it so you don't have to plan for that in your budget if you have a car that's not going to break down. But if you if you pay for those in cash, all of a sudden you can take – out of your fixed cost or 10% out of your fixed cost and use that in other places in your budget. Also, let's talk a little bit about the mortgage because when mortgage costs exceed what you really can afford, then you're you're basically stuck where your budget's not going to work. And most people want to figure out how to change everything else except their mortgage. We've done the research that People who do well on their budget and with their finances have a lower cost of living than other people, maybe their peers. They've made a really good decision that that cost of a mortgage or their rent is going to be lower than the national averages. Mm -hmm. I did one of those online calculators the other day as we were looking at some real estate of, you know, what we could afford in terms of what the, you plug in your numbers. How much do you earn? How much can you put down? Uh, What can you borrow? And it really shocked me because what the lender said I could afford is probably two times greater than what I would ever even consider doing as far as a wise financial decision. And I think that's where people get in a trap on their budget. They, They maximize their ability to leverage for a house. Well, and in today's world... You lose uh, income or have your your job, your hours cut back, then you're in serious trouble. Well, people get upside down Mm -hmm. pretty quickly, Mm -hmm. and they get what's called a a negative mortgage or underwater on their mortgage, and their budget's not working and nothing's working. They're suddenly house poor. And so you have to look at all of those fixed expenses and be sure they fit into the right categories. And then then you start to look at your variable expenses. Do you remember when you brought our monthly uh, grocery expense down? Well, I've tried several times. Tell me which one you're, what time you're thinking about. <laughs> well, it's when we had four boys at home, and you calculated that we were spending $1,000 mm. a month on groceries. This is not eating <laughs> out. Well, I, I remember one summer it was terrible because we two of our boys were playing tennis. So we told them, just go ahead and stay and eat 
at the club, eat lunch. That was all summer long. And when we got the bill each month, I was shocked, just shocked. Because they were snacking, they were eating lunch, having an afternoon snack. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I think you put an end to that pretty quick. I, I'm, I'm thinking that they spent $1,000 one month on food. Well, what I'm remembering is that we were going through, you know, the, feeding those four boys, we were going through so much money. You said, Chuck, we can't afford what we're doing. And I said, well, we've got to eat. And to me, I didn't think there was any room to change that $1,000 a month number. And you drove it down to $400 a month. Mm -hmm. And the way you did it is you said the new rule is we're not going to buy at the grocery store what you want. And you were pretty much talking to me because I go to the grocery store with a cart and will throw in there anything I want. That's how I go shopping. You go shopping with a list and with coupons. I didn't think it was possible to feed our family for a month and reduce $600 out of our budget, but you did it. And there was some fussing. You know, we started buying generic cereal instead of name brand cereal. And we started buying things that, you know, maybe weren't real popular items, the biggest, most marketed items, but we ate well. Well, and today I still, I will stock up on things that are on sale. And those, you know, I like to get the clearance items and I'll just, um, we have lots of space. So I will, I will stock up. And so we always have some kind of snack or something to feed guests or when the kids have friends over. Well, when you think about making a budget work, I look at things that people can do that will will really help them to put this to, into action. Number one is to agree with your spouse. Mm -hmm. If you're not in agreement with your plan and with your goals, then you're always going to be going back and forth and, and un, uncertain about whether you really want to achieve it. You and I agreed it was time. We had to do something. We couldn't keep living going backwards. We had to make progress. And so we were in agreement, finally, that a budget would be good for us. I think, secondly, we realized we had to have grace because it's difficult to make it work every month. And sometimes people get frustrated and they get disappointed and they, they, they sort of throw their hands up and say, we just can't do it. it. You know, we're not good with numbers or it doesn't work for our house or we can't get along about this. And there's just no grace. And once there's grace, when you realize, hey, let's try again. Let's, let's keep at this until we get it right. The beautiful part of that, about that grace is there's such long-term reward from getting it right and from doing it. You know, when I look at where we were to where we've come, and it's almost a, an equal split. Do you realize that? 21 mm -hmm. years of doing it the wrong way and 21 years of doing it God's way. Mm -hmm. It's almost an equal split. Do you ever think like this? I wish we had started when we were younger. Oh, goodness, yes. We. Oh, I can't imagine where we'd be now. You know, one thing for me that has been helpful is I try to challenge myself. I remember those early days when we were cutting back on groceries. I would think, okay, I can serve this for $2 a person. And then the next night I'd see if I could beat that, you know, because I'm sort of motivated by the challenge. We took some kids, some boys through a class. Remember that? Well, we started teaching uh, teenage junior high boys how to budget. Mm-hmm. And I remember you laid down the challenge. I, we had laid, put all this out to them. And we said one night, everybody bring $5 and we're going to use it for a party. And so the first challenge was they could go out to eat for $5. This was some years ago. But whatever they had left over, we would use to throw a party the next week. This was probably 20 years ago. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. And so these guys all fussed. Every one of these boys went, we can't eat on $5. And there'll be nothing left over. We, and, and you just held the line. Well, just try it. So they started researching where to go eat. And they ended up at CC's Pizza, which I'm not sure would pass the health code uh, in our city at that time. <laughs> but it was very, very inexpensive. And they went to the buffet. They ate. And each one, I think, had about 50 to 75 cents left over when they came back. 
and they gave you $9. Mm -hmm. And you looked at it and said, okay, they had spent like 45 or 50 to eat out. You had nine dollars left over for the party and pick up there and what happened? Well, I can't. I think I made soup. I know I made brownies. I had a box of br- that I made brownies from. You made bread. You made soup and you made brownies. I okay. remember the meal. Huh. And they said to you, "We ate better than at the pizza place." Mm-hmm. And how for a did dollar you? A person, almost or less. less. And they were like, "How did you do that?" And when we go back and talk to some of those boys, they remember that lesson that you really can stretch your money further than you think is possible. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that we learn to live by ourselves. And I'm not a frugal person. Many people listening think, oh, well, Anne is so frugal and she she probably enjoys that, which you do. I don't enjoy it. You don't have time to think about it. I don't like to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so I've allowed you to be the captain of the budget. You know, you set it up, you manage it, and I follow as best I can because I know it's good for us. And I know you're better at it than me. If I had to do it, I we would still be back where we were, you know, when we were first married. <laughs> We'd make no progress. Uh, it's not comfortable with me. Most people would think, well, I must, you know, it must be easy for me. It's not, but it's good for me and it's good for us. And I think it's the right thing that God wants people to do. I, I think one thing that really helped us initially was when we had to write down every dollar we spent. Yeah, we carried little notebooks, and mm-hmm. we would write it down for a whole month. Mm-hmm. And I would give you my notebook, and you would total it, and we would realize all the spontaneous spending and the things we didn't realize where the money was actually going. Right. And that's really the beginning of a budget, is knowing where the money is going before you start the allocation. Well, we change spending patterns and develop new habits. I remember one young couple told me that before they got married, they both went to Starbucks a lot, studied there just, you know, almost every day. Well, when they got married, they started tracking their expenses and they were shocked at how much they... They were spending $300 a month at Starbucks. I remember talking to that couple. Yeah. I remember the other couple that we were sitting in their lake house that they had paid for with cash. It was a second home. They built it for themselves, their children and grandchildren to use. It had 12 bedrooms. They were talking about the faithfulness of God to provide for them. But they both still have envelopes Mm -hmm. that they've carried. At that point, it was like 50 years of marriage. And she got out her envelopes and said, Here's how much money I have for my hair appointments every week. These are non-negotiable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she, that's always in her budget. She had her grocery envelope in there. She had, you know, little uh, gift envelope for gifts for the kids and grandkids. Everything was allocated. And they didn't need to be on that budget, but they wouldn't consider ever changing it. Mm-mm. They loved it. And both of them did it. And they had plenty of money, but they were just so careful with how they used it. I think God honors that when we're really careful with what he's given us and we get out of thinking that, well, it's all mine and I can do with it whatever I want. You know, Crown creates a lot of tools to help people to to establish a budget. One of the things that's absolutely free is just to go up to our website and download the forms. And we have forms for people who are single, people who are um, just new couples or married with children or people who live in high uh, real estate cost areas, because that's a very different dynamic on uh, people's budgets. We have staff members who are living in high uh, real estate cost areas and working remotely. And so we have all those scenarios that people can download for free. But one of the tools I think is so helpful is an easy guide to a budget you love. And in a sense, it's like sitting down with a trusted mentor who would dig out of you the plans that you want, the goals that you have, and you write those things down so that your budget matches where you are. I think most people quit when a budget doesn't solve a problem for them. If you know it's going to solve a problem and help you achieve what you want to achieve in life, then you're going to stay motivated and you're going to stay diligent. And by the way, we haven't talked about diligence. Uh, I would say in our family, you're the one with maybe the most discipline, you know, in terms of just doing it very, very particularly. 
you know, being really, really careful about it. But discipline with your budget is such a good thing. Discipline means that you're able to say no. You can say no to the things that you want right now because that enables you to actually delay gratification and to achieve something for tomorrow that you said no to today. Well, and I think sometimes people give up. If they fail one month, they just give up. And I liken it to a toddler who falls down but gets up and tries walking again. You have to try to live by a budget. And the, the beautiful thing about it is you can, you can rework your numbers. It may not work the first time the way you've set it up. So go back and adjust your numbers. Well, what I like to see is people do a very conservative budget Mm -hmm. where they estimate sort of the worst case scenario on their income or their job or their circumstances, and then God surprises them with income they didn't expect. And that's when you start to make real progress. It's like you've got your foot on the brake when it comes to expenses And once you start figuring out that you can have a break and you can really manage your spending and control that, sometimes God puts his foot on the gas pedal and your income increases. And so you get this big gap or margin. The tragedy of so many of the people that may be listening right now is they have plenty of money, but they have no margin. And what's really hurting them is the lack of margin. You know, to me, that's how far can you limbo under that bar of your income. And if you can create a big gap with margin, then you can make more progress. Yeah, and I think it's very important to hold each other accountable in love and have friends or mentors that um, will encourage encourage you along the way. Well, and there are surprises and there are unexpected difficulties and there are detours that you have a setback. I've known people who've had a setback for a whole year. Maybe it was a hospital visit. Maybe it was an unexpected child Uh, And they just can't make progress. But that's where diligence comes in Mm -hmm. because it's that breakthrough year that may happen where those things don't go wrong or you don't have an unexpected. And then suddenly you're able to increase your savings, increase your emergency fund, and and start to see the, the excitement of these things actually coming to pass. You know, Ann, I was thinking of some of the seniors that we have helped and counseled, not just young couples, because that's where there's a lot of stress and a lot of sort of getting on the track early on that we didn't have. But there are seniors that need budgets. And we've got elderly family that mm-hmm. we're seeing the, the difficulty when there's been a lack of planning and there's been a lack of preparation. And so even seniors need help and they need to be sure that they've prepared for that day when they could find themselves single again. So this is an important discipline. It's an important part of managing finances the way God wants us to manage them. And I'm so grateful we learned to do it. It took a lot of pain for us to get there, but we've learned. I know you would say we're a work in progress. There are some months that it doesn't go well. There are some months that we don't make the progress that we would hope to make. But overall, We're doing the things that are pushing us in the direction where we're honoring God first, we're preparing for the future, and we're experiencing that lack of stress that a budget can bring. Yeah, and I'm always looking at ways that I can cut back or postpone a purchase, hoping the price will go down. Well, I don't know anybody that can stretch money (laughs) as far as you can, Ann. No, I I, I mean that in 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 the right sense. You take joy in that, and that's one of the things I've had to adjust to in my own life in terms of being comfortable with that. The way I shop is, to me, it's a waste of time. So I walk in the store, look for what I want, buy it in about five minutes, and have them deliver it. You wouldn't even imagine that. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) You know, you're going to prepare for that trip, You're going to know what you're looking for. You're going to have done your research. You're probably going to find it. You're going to see when it's coming on sale, what you can do to save money in purchasing that item, and then wait even longer. I was going to say, or just just pretend I don't need it. Just live without it. Yeah, look at it a while and say, oh, we can live without it. Yeah. So there's people listening who are thinking it's just not going to happen for them. 
And I remember realizing in our life that there's actually a bell curve to consumption. When you get married, you're you're young and you you don't re- recognize it, but everything in front of you for a couple of decades, you have to consume more. Uh, I, I call it going into the plastic phase of life, where you got to buy the high chair, the you know the stroller, the car carriers, the little things for your children. All of that just accumulates. Legos are everywhere. And it's just buy, buy, buy. And before you know it, it's like there is no margin. But if you establish those disciplines early, like we wish we had of, you can get through the the steep phase of the consumption part of your life. And then it starts to plateau. And up near the top, the children start to leave and go on their own. And, and suddenly your the demands go down, the expenses go down. And then on the other side of that curve, you're not having to buy a lot. In fact, we're at that getting rid of stage. And you make a lot of financial progress during that stage. So there's hope for people who are not there right now. They're not there today. Just remember that bell curve. Just do the things that are important every single day. Be faithful. And if I were to just summarize, and you can help me, or remember some of the things we said here, And Number one is to be on the same page. Just agree with each other. Work towards agreement. And pray pray together. Yeah, and express what you really want. Mm -hmm. Verbalize an improved future, a desired future. Verbalize something that you really, really long for in your marriage, in your life, things you want to accomplish so that you're doing this with a purpose. I would say, secondly, write it down and know where you are. Never lose track of where you are. Don't get behind on tracking your receipts or or recording it on a spreadsheet, whatever methodology. Do the discipline early. Set it up where it's somewhat automatic. Like the bank account method, it just sort of is automatic. And then develop a, a discipline, which is the ability to say no. And discipline will pay dividends for the rest of your life. And one thing is by waiting, you allow God to work. And sometimes things are provided just out of the blue. A friend will give you something or unexpected money comes in to pay for it. Well, we've heard that over and over. I mean, I I remember the family who, I, I don't remember, they had eight or 10 children and one of them was a concert pianist, mm-hmm. and they wanted a grand piano. And the father was like, no way, no way. You know, we'll never have a grand piano. And they began to pray about it as a family. Mm-hmm. And a friend of the family said, look, I've got a piano that doesn't fit in my house anymore. Could you use it? And it was the perfect Steinway Grand that all of their children used. And they never had to buy it. Right. They, they all got to learn to, you know, to play and practice, and God provides if we wait. Right. So, Anne, thanks for uh, sharing. We've done our best at it. We would say we're, we're still, uh, there's times that we struggle. There's times that we don't do it as well as we can talk about doing it. But overall, we've made great progress, and we hope this has been encouraging to others.